Good afternoon. Uh, it's good to see everybody here. Uh, my name is Ed Schaller, and I'm here to talk about uh, Web3 application server, JSP Engine. Good and some work I did with that, and uh, what turned out to be a very interesting exploit. Um, out of curiosity, how many people here actually run or are familiar with Web3 application server? So a fair member, uh, number. Okay, so maybe I can move forward from some of this fairly quickly. This is a rather complex exploit, but it, it's pretty simple when it comes down to it. And it's a little unfortunate when your screen server comes on. If I trip, first of all, um, this is our outline. Uh, the slides are going to be on the website as soon as I put them up there with the exploit and such. Um, so we're going to talk about what Web Server Application Server is, talk about JSPs and nulls, Web Server Plugin and nulls, WebInf, yeah, you see it there. And we're going to have a demo and talk about the fixes and extras and uh, should be good. So, first of all, Web Server Application Server's architecture. WebSphere Application Server is IBM's um, JEE application server. It's um, one of the more popular uh, JEE application servers, at least according to Gartner. It's up there with um, Oracle and Microsoft as the top three. Um, it's heavily used in the financial services industry and uh, in the insurance sectors. And uh, it's not very cheap, so I'm probably not going to go buy it for your own website. Um, but there is a time bomb free um, version online, a trial you can go and you can get, you can download. So. I have to warn you that uh, I have in the best authority that the initials WAS are pronounced WAS, but I always get it wrong and say WAS, so you can laugh at me every time I do that, whatever. So, anyway, here we have the common uh, network architecture that you usually see in a WAS deployment. You have uh, the client browsers, obviously, on the internet. They then connect through a firewall to your web servers, and those web servers then redirect um, through the HTTP um, the WAS web server plugin into the actual web servers. The, this is done with a HTTP connection that is handled by the web server plugin. The web server plug, um, first of all, this is the common architecture as IBM shows it. Um, if you look at this, it's hard to see, I realize, but the main features here is that the big gray box is WAS itself, and you have the web server plugin in between it and the internet. So realistically, being that the web server plugin forwards everything into WAS, if you compromise a web app on WAS or WAS itself through the web container, uh, basically whatever you compromise has full access to most of the internal resources that WAS does, with little, some exceptions depending on the network deployment that's done. So the plugin is what's in between it and the internet. I'm getting ahead of myself. And uh, more web application can do all that. So the web server plugin is uh, what we need to describe a little bit first to understand. I'm going to refer back to this architecture because we're going to jump around between the different areas to understand it. This is basically an extension module that sits inside the web server, whether that be for Apache, IBM's Apache, which is the IBM HTTP server, IHS, IIS, several other ones, including Lotus Domino and things like that. So basically, it just connects straight via HTTP to the actual WAS instance's web container at special headers to keep track of where the client came from and such. So it's mostly used for load balancing and failover, so that if one application server goes down, it detects that, and then it forwards to a different application server in turn. One thing that is important to realize about the plugin if you're dealing with a WAS installation is that its primary purpose is not for security. In fact, it's really not to do anything with security. In some cases, people I see people actually doing trying to do blocking rules on IHS and such to try to protect things on WAS, and this can cause issues, as we'll talk about a little more later here. So, let's talk about the URL handling and the plugin itself. Not all of the requests that go into the URL plugin on the web server actually get forwarded back to WAS. What it does is it bases the URL configuration, it bases on effectively the same sort of things that are done for the web container itself, from the web.xml and from IBM's extensions uh, configurations inside the WAR file that you're running on. So. As we know, these are simple file blobs that get pushed in. They are matched in sequence. The web server plugin is actually very simple, although it's frequently misunderstood. So if you're asking for a servlet, it forwards it in. If you're asking, you know, if you have a simple blob, it forwards in. And what we're going to be talking about is start a JSP, anything that is JSP, it forwards in. Um, if you have the web server, the WAS feature of file serving enabled, this is a, a kind of an IBM specific function that if you don't have it enabled, Static content inside your WAR does not get served. If you do have it enabled, it does get served. So if you have it enabled, all the connections get passed from the web server into WAS. This is one I see misunderstood a lot of times. Um, 
If a match occurs, the connection is forwarded in, much like a reverse proxy. Uh, otherwise, the request is handled for the web server. The reason for this is it's usually used to handle static content from the web server as a speed optimization, so that the static content gets served by IHS or Apache instead of going all the way to WAS and served from Java. So this is just frequently misunderstood. It's amazing how much I see it. If, if you're interested more, there's actually a paper about it that IBM has that's referenced in the slides I recommend looking at. And it's actually for an older version of WAS, but the plugin actually hasn't changed much in quite a while, actually. So now let's talk about uh, JSPs and how they handle null. Now we're going to talk, we're from the plugin here onto the WAS instance, the Web Server Application Server. And let's talk about strings. I assume that most people know about strings. Strings under Java, um, the, off under sitting in, the, the operating system sitting underneath Java is written in C, which of course has null terminating strings, and which means that you cannot put null characters into a string and have them used later on because it terminates a string that's being used. Whereas Java is a counted string uh, that can have nulls in it. So the big question is, of course, that we're going to start with here is what happens if you try to open a file in Java like test.txt backslash zero? So with a null character in, in Java? Well, actually you get test.txt. Uh, this has been known about for a very long time. Uh, formally, just this specific instance has been talked about some people on, on the web, but it's been know about, known and used in uh, Tomcat exploits for quite a while. So. What about the JSP engine inside of WAS? How does it deal with the null character coming in to WAS? JSP handling is very simple. It locates the file, it translates the .jsp into Java, and then it compiles it into a servlet and runs it. So what happens with WAS, or at least WAS before it was patched, if we request uh, %00.jsp for a arbitrary, arbitrary file inside the WAR? Well, the answer is it actually compiled it as test.txt as a servlet and runs it as a JSP. Uh, this is similar to what I'm not even trying to pronounce it. Those are the characters on the web. I didn't make a mistake. Um, it's found in Tomcat. If you're here, I, I really apologize. <laughs> so, um, so this allows us to read files through the JSP engine. This may seem not, not too useful, but we'll see how this can be added to in a series to actually make something useful happen. So basically, if we have our context root for a web application, we just append %00.jsp to the end of it, and we'll get the file. Obviously, we have some restrictions on what files we can get. We can't just get any file from the web server we want. It must be in the, the WAR file, which is usually expanded. And we can't read files in meta-inf or web-inf, and it must compile and run as a JSP, which actually isn't too useful unless file serving is turned off and you're trying to get files that aren't put on the, um, the IHS instance that's serving static contents. So the question then comes as you're looking at these files is, what's a valid JSP? Turns out that um, basically anything that doesn't include a less than percent sign is a valid JSP as far as the WAS JSP engine is concerned. Uh, HTML usually qualifies under this, XML. Um, most text files, then you get some really weird ones, like you can download zip files and jar files. I didn't know these compiled as JSPs, but they do. Um, most class files also do. So you can, you can get a lot of interesting things through the, through the JSP engine in this manner. Still not doing anything too, too interesting, but what about directories? Um, for some reason, and I really don't know why, if you open up a directory in the same manner in um, WAS's JSP engine, it uh, gives you a list of all the contents of that directory. And I'm really not sure why, because if you open up a normal file in Java from like, you just do a file, a uh, new file object and open a you know, file input stream, it doesn't happen. So <laughs> they must be doing something special here and I haven't been able to track that down in the time I've had. So basically you can request your context root with a null character after it, .jsp, and you can suddenly get a directory listing, which is obviously a lot more interesting than just getting the static files because they have to have directory listing enabled and most sites aren't gonna be doing that, we hope. Um, there are times when you actually have to use a period in front of the um, directory. This is usually the case with the context root, where you have to do percent, uh, dot percent zero zero. Uh, interesting enough, in some cases you can actually do dot dot, but it has to, the way that WAS handles the dot dot uh, normalization and checks to make sure you're not getting outside of the WAR, 
is pretty specific, except it only checks for slash dot dot slash. So you can actually use this to read the contents of the exploded war, I mean, exploded ear. This is kind of one of these things where you see it and you're like, oh, I can almost get those files, but I can't. So it's just rather frustrating, honestly. But you can do it. Um, so this is a lot better than just serving up static files to the JSP engine, because suddenly we can list and enumerate internals of your WAR and what files that you may have accidentally left in there in terms of JSPs or other files that are being added to the WAR in the process of this application running, which sometimes in and of itself can be a really lot of interesting information. I dealt with one application that put all its logs inside the, web, the, the exploded WAR, so once you found out the directories, you could get them all. So, we have to circle back here and go talk about the WebSphere plugin. In most instances of WAS, you're not going to see direct connections to WAS that aren't going through the plugin or some sort of proxy in front of it. And there are good reasons for this, primarily dealing with, with speed and uh, static content especially. So, the plugin wasn't des really designed for security, but in some cases it gets in the way of insecurity too. So um, I don't know if that really means it's a security device or not. But the problem is that going for a null byte in WAS is easy. Uh, but the plugin is written in C, and so um, it really doesn't like the null character. It terminates your string, and um, instead of getting your test.txt, you get test.txt, uh, which WAS then just tries to serve out as a normal static file. And if you're not serving static files, then you can't get it, or if you're trying to do a directory. So the next challenge in this puzzle in terms of how to actually do something useful with this vulnerability is to figure out how to get nulls past the plugin. So character encodings. This also qualifies as one of those things that if you think something is generally known by the industry, check. Um, most of the character codings we deal with are either ASCII, ISO Latin in the United States. Um, internal to Java, you have um, UTF-16, 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 and uh, but what may not be known is that UTF-8 is actually how Java reads strings natively. So even though it keeps it in memory in UTF-16, it actually reads them as, as UTF-8. And um, so UTF-8 is a multi-byte byte character encoding. It's actually a rather elegant character encoding. If you follow the character encoding improperly, okay, if you, if you just do it a default implementation and don't really think about it, Single byte characters, and actually any smaller than the full maximum bytes characters, can be actually encoded as multiple bytes. Um, this is explicitly forbidden by the spec. Um, but who follows specs? I mean, come on. Actually, there's a lot that don't. Um, you may remember there have been a lot of Microsoft IIS exploits that uh, have utilized this. And it turns out that Java also um, used to do this as well. It decodes early long ones. This was made known uh, as part of another Tomcat vulnerability by Simon and William, and I'm not going to try to pronounce that sentence, I'm sorry. It was fixed in, fixed by Sun and their JVM quite some time ago, and uh, it was also fixed by IBM. They share a lot of uh, common code, and so they share a lot of security fixes. The problem is that for some reason IBM's fix didn't work. It actually has to deal with the fact that Sun's JVM now by default uses NIO. And so when IBM took that patch and applied it to their JVM, they didn't think about the fact that um, their JVM doesn't use NIO by default to read strings, and apparently they never tested this. So one of the morals of the story is test your security patches. Um, this has really been fixed <laughs> in these uh, new releases of the JVM, uh, very thankfully. Unfortunately, this is not any WAS fix packs yet, so you're still looking at having this uh, particular encoding issues in WAS unless you actually install the JVM by hand. I don't know if they're going to do an iFix of this. The IBM folks have been very nice about all this, actually. So, um, so let's talk about UTF-8 then and what we can do with that with the WebServer plugin. Well, the plugin is in C, and it handles single byte characters, so ASCII and ISO Latin. And it doesn't know anything about UTF-8, and especially not overly long UTF-8 characters. So if WAS is in Java using a JVM that accepts overly long UTF-8 characters, then we can just, uh, instead of doing a percent zero zero, we can do a c080.jsp, and suddenly we bypass the plugin's problem with the null, and we get our nulls to the back in Java, in WAS, and we can actually get these files. So, plug is no longer an obstacle to doing anything fun with this. This gets a little bit better. So, 
we mentioned that web ints and meta ints, again, back here on WAS, are not accessible. If you look at the spec, the service specification explicitly says that you're supposed to return a 404 for anything inside meta int for web ints. This has actually been a source of major problems for a long time. If you actually go and grab all the class files in WAS, you'll find that it's checked a ridiculous number of times. Um, and they still missed one. There may be other ones, unfortunately. Um, it turns out that their file serving servlet that handles when file serving is enabled actually talks about, actually allows a slash dot slash web inf dot slash web dot XML. So you can actually grab files outside of the web inf directory. If you're not familiar with Java web applications, this is where all your configuration is. This is where a lot of your code actually is too that you can then download and decompile. So this was fixed in PK64302. Um, a potential security exposure of the file serving feature enabled. Uh, there was no details released about this, so there may be other things that were fixed in that same fix pack. I'm not sure. I never really analyzed it, but I know it didn't work afterwards. So surely they didn't just check this in the file server server. Uh, well, yeah. So if you do a dot slash in webinf, you can actually get it through the JSP engine as well, which is obviously a problem. The plugin also, however, normalizes paths, so we have to play our encoding games again to uh, get around that. But in which case, we can still go in and get the web.xml, the main configuration for your web application, by using uh, percent zero, percent AE, which is an overly long period in our path, which the plugin does not recognize, and then our percent zero, percent eight zero, which is uh, overly long null byte, and suddenly we actually get the web.xml. This was fixed along with the percent zero zero dot JSP issue in uh, PK81387, which I was surprised I was talking to one of the IBM architect, uh, security architects and he said this was the only number he can remember for fix facts, so they worked really hard on it. <laughs> um, possible application source file exposure, which hopefully everybody has applied at this point. This also works for meta -inf in case you want to go look at things that are left in there. So the big question is, is this the whole truth? and nothing but the truth. You can actually make possible application source file actually be remote code execution in many instances. So, again back here in WAS, instead of the plugin, we look at JSP striking back. If you remember, we locate a file, translate the JSP to Java, we compile it, and then we run it as a servlet. So, if we can get a file into the WAR, we can get remote code execution through this method. So, I was looking at a web application and I had an interesting discovery playing this game with WebInf. Here's a listing of the directory of WebInf and there's this attachments directory. Does anybody know what that attachments directory is? I'm just curious. As I've... So, what it turns out to be is that Apache Access 1 is implement SOAP with attachments. This is not Access 2. We're talking about Access 1, which is a little older. Okay. Um, for those of you not familiar with SOAP with attachments, is implemented very similar to how email is. It uses MIME headers and actually goes through and attaches things as MIME you know, entries, MIME bodies to the main request so that you have a SOAP, your SOAP envelope with all of its goodies, and then you have your attachments that are referenced from your SOAP service. Okay? When large files actually go through access, it caches them to disk so that you're not you know, running your application server out of memory in the process of handling a SOAP attachment anything over 32 kilobytes, and by default these get put into the WebInf attachments directory. So, this directory is created, if not present, at startup. And guess what was this JAX RPC implementation is based on? But not their uh, JAX WS implementation, which is of course based on Access 2 instead. So, Apache Access actually has some interesting bugs that make this less true than you would think. Uh, it's very good at optimizing how it reads in attachments from the network. So if your service actually doesn't handle attachments, it doesn't even bother reading them. So it doesn't get to the point where it actually caches up the disk, which is rather frustrating because we'd have to find a SOAP service that handles attachments. And at least in my, where I work, we don't have very many of those, if any. So it's a lot rarer to have this, which makes our, our attack a little harder. Um, so it occurred to me, well, what happens if we just, you know, you have a series of MIME attachments, you know, instead of putting the SOAP body first, like everybody does, what if we put our attachment before the SOAP body, and, uh, you know, so that our attachment has to be read before it reads the, the actual SOAP message? Well, it turns out that that actually works, but um, there's this other little bug in <laughs> access, the way it handles uh, thread local variables. 
that if you do that, it actually saves it to another file system directory, specifically where your temp directory is for Java IO, which is you know usually slash temp on Unix machines. Um, so great, we can DOS two file systems instead of one with access, but that doesn't really help us very much. So let's talk about SOAP encoding. SOAP encoding actually allows you to reference attachments. We just need to reference that attachment and it'll read them in. It allows this href attributes to be applied to parameters and such inside our SOAP message. So when used with Apache 1, Apache Access 1, it'll actually parse the attachments and cache the large ones to our disk where we want them inside our webinf directory. So this of course requires that we have a web service that's actually using SOAP encoding. So we're talking here about RPC encoded messages as opposed to uh, document literal or RPC literal, which are different methods of using SOAP. I swear this is not my fault. Access One provides an interesting feature, which unfortunately is not present in the WAS implementation, uh, the WAS extension of Apache Access One, so we can't use it directly with WAS. And what happens is that the client, for whatever strange reason, can actually send a fault to the server as this initial request. Usually this isn't something that should be happening, so not surprisingly the server says, what? Send me faults. I'm supposed to send you faults, not vice versa. So, um, but the nice thing is that it parses it anyway first, and um, just for fun, so fuzz is encoding, soap encoding. So uh, we can send attachments with them too. So not only are we sending a fault, we're sending a fault with an attachment. And it also doesn't require any web services to be actually configured in Access One. It just requires the exposure to the Access One servlet itself, which is plenty enough to actually get this to work. So let's talk about actually how to use this. Um, we have to put together a lot of things here to make this actually work. First, the attachment file names are, are you know, fairly random. And uh, the first thing we have to do to actually exploit this is we have to connect to WAS use the JSP bug to figure out what's currently in the attachments directory. Baseline that, then we send up our attachment as a SOAP fault, then we get a directory listing after that, and we go through and find the JSP that we put in there, the file we put in there, and we request it as a JSP, at which point the file is translated to Java, file, and run. Which means we've achieved remote co-execution on WAS with all of it. So, to demonstrate this, we have a little cute SOAP uh, a shell over JSP, which baselines the attachment directly, uploads the JSP with the SOAP fault, finds new attachments, and then checks that it actually has this attachment in case the service is already handling attachments, in which case you have to find your own. There is a race condition here in some, in, on some servers, depending on how they're configured and how the timeout is, especially in, in a WAS instance that's deployed for development instead of production. So in our case, we need to copy our JSP quickly out of that directory so it doesn't get removed while we're using it, which is kind of frustrating. Um, and then a proxy standard input and standard output from command line to over HTTP to the server. So if you're going to use this, and finally when it's done, it, re it removes itself. This is exceptionally noisy in the log, so it's not exactly very useful for anything but a demo, but it's great for demos. So let's do this. Um, here I have a... Uh, was 7.0 instance, uh, 7.0 fix pack one, which is the last fix pack that was vulnerable. Inside of this, I have the demo application, which is going to be on the website uh, this afternoon, that is running. And uh, it actually is being accessed through the plugin, which gives us our, our plugin page. And uh, the access servlet is actually mapped to uh, just slash access one. At this point, we can we have a, a shell script that is running our Java exploit that takes the, the context root directory and then the, the relative path to the access one servlet and gives a command name that we want to execute. And with this case, we want to execute the um, uh, shell. So in this case, we see it updating and baselining it, and then we're hitting it very quickly in this case because this is this instance is running in dev development mode, and therefore it removes the... the our attachment very quickly, it then finds it, baselines it, and it gives the shell of the server on the server. So, and we have full access to the server that's running WAS. This tends to make WAS admins really unhappy incidentally when they start executing commands. 
it's actually much more efficient if you actually want to exploit WAS to actually you know run stuff in your JSP and have stuff natively stored inside of WAS instead of creating a shell because most of these get a little fishy when they see a PS list that um, includes a shell being launched from WAS because it really shouldn't happen. So <laughs> afterwards, we just uh, remove the JSP and we're done. So we clean up after ourselves and hopefully nobody noticed. But with that exploit, it's very noisy, so um, people will notice. Hopefully, um, not that you couldn't do it a different way. So let's talk about fixes. This has been fixed. Uh, first, we have the affected platforms. Was runs on an unbelievable number of platforms. I counted 15, and I'm pretty sure I'm wrong. I'm pretty sure it's more than that when you consider everything. AX and Linux were the ones I dealt with explicitly, because that's what we run. Um, case insensitive file systems actually are interesting because they're not vulnerable to the percent bug. And um, this actually, I believe, has to do with an earlier fix for uh, security problems with uh, case insensitive file systems. Uh, the only one I know of is, of course, Windows that WAS runs on. So if you're running Windows, you don't have to worry about this one. Um, all, well, you still have to worry about the encoding issues and that. The overly long UTF-8 encoding obviously depends on the JVM that's in use on the application server. In uh, non-IBM JVMs, hopefully this will be fixed before the IBM one at this point. Um, those two that I know of are going to be HPUX, which runs on a HPVM, a JVM, and Solaris, which runs the Sun one, obviously. Um, in terms of versions, uh, 6.0 was fixed in uh, 6.035, which is the same as 6.023, which is fixed back 35. 6.1 was in fixed back 23. Uh, 7.0, fixed back 3. And other versions, you can apply the iFix. There was also fixed packs for 5.1 and 5.2, but I don't have access to those to try them. So hopefully you have this done. Now let's talk about IBM for a second. 15 platform variants that I count. I'm on the low side, I'm pretty sure, because I didn't count things like IA64 for Windows and such. Four maintained versions, about 60 different variants. Can you guess how long it took them to fix this? Ballpark? Eight months? It's pretty how about two weeks? I'm impressed. How do you do 60 different variants in two weeks and have a public fix from the time I tell them? I, I was uh, I, very, very surprised. Uh, if you are dealing with IBM for security vulnerabilities, I would recommend that uh, when possible that you always submit them as a PMR, that is a service request, because that is how they handle everything related to their software. And if you don't do it that way, you're kind of in the la-la land where they're not sure what they're doing, and you may get forgotten about. But if you do as a PMR, they will get it done, and sometimes they can do absolutely amazing things, like two weeks to fix this sort of thing. They also ticked off a lot of people, too, as we'll talk about in a second. Um, their fix is actually very elegant. This is, you know, my pseudocode for it. Basically, they look at the file they're trying to open, and they ask the operating system to canonicalize it, and they compare the two, and they say, is this really the file I'm opening? And if they don't match it, uh, well, there's a 404, which uh, is nice. Um, this actually has problems with it. It caused a lot of problems with people who are running on, on Unix systems that, for whatever reason, were putting symbolic links in their uh, exploded wires because that will fail. That test right there, because it, the canonicalization of a file path in Unix will actually return the uh, absolute path, not the symbolic link. So that was a problem. There's some fixes for that. I haven't looked at it specifically. Uh, the WebM fix is uh, not quite as elegant. They just check to make sure you have don't have WebM anywhere in the URL path, which solves this, this problem. Uh, it does work very well. Uh, my guess is that I haven't tried it. If you try to have a subdirectory that's called WebM, web it won't work. But hopefully that shouldn't happen too frequently. So before we talk about workarounds, we're going to talk about some workarounds that you can do. But first, um, you're more than a year behind on patches at this point if you're, if you're working workarounds. Uh, it's a really good thing you're not running you know, other servers. Um, so the best workaround that I, I like the best is actually to disable the runtime compilation uh, and reloading of JSPs. This is a little frustrating. The information center will actually tell you you can disable it at the application level. This is done with uh, putting some specific features into the IBM web hc.xmi. There used to be a way to do this at the container level. It's still in the information center, and I can't get it to work. So I don't believe that it's supported anymore. Uh, this is makes the fix a little harder because you're dealing with it in application by application level instead of actually doing it on your entire server or your cell. Um, of course, once you disable runtime compilation JSPs, you're going to want to make sure that you uh, pre-compile JSPs, either deployment time or batch compile them before you go in there. Doing that works great. Um, the other way to do this is to block JSPs. 
which uh, we have to talk about a little bit. Of course, if you actually need direct access to JSPs, this is not going to work. It's going to break your application. But for a lot of people these days, you're using Mobile View Controller, whether that's Struts or Spring MVC or some other um, web framework, the, usually your JSPs are only in views and only forwarded to internally, so you actually can do this without breaking stuff. Um, there's a lot more issues here that we can talk about before blocking JSPs. So, I got a question. What do the following byte sequences have in column if the title doesn't give away? So, AD through C1BF. I'm not going to read these. They're all invalid byte sequences for UCF8. Any guesses what the IBM JVM does with them? This is the fixed JVM. Do you think this is a problem? An empty string? This actually, uh, in the, the unfixed JVM, it only does it for A through FF because they didn't consider all very long invalid anymore. This is obviously you know, very useful for IDS evasion because you can throw as many invalid UCF8 characters into your URL as you want, and the IBM and JVM will ignore them when it parses them. So suddenly, you know, you can be, you know, requesting a whole path and, you know, replace every other, you know, add a new character, a new invalid, you know, percent 80 or something invalid UTF-8 code anywhere you want and get around it. Uh, of course, this also makes it very difficult to write JSP blocking rules. Uh, so if you're going to write a JSP blocking rule, you have to worry about this. And there's lots of fun games you can play with encoding, these encoding issues, honestly. The other thing you need to remember if you're going to try to block JSPs is that there's more than JSP that by default with laws. Uh, start at JSP, start at JSW are also handled as JSPs, and in some cases also start at JSPX, of course, if you're using newer versions. Um, so if you're actually going to go and try to do blocking JSP rules, you need to actually use the UTF-8 or the long decoding. Got to keep that in mind. Got to keep the decoding of invalid ones, the replacement string. And uh, of course, multiple JSP connections uh, extensions. At which point, I would really recommend applying the patch because this is not trivial to do. One of my friends tried; um, he did a good job on it actually, but it was not very pretty. So, a note in browsers: if anybody goes home and starts playing with this, um, don't forget that your browser will normalize this, your dots and such. It also does the same thing with URL encoding in some cases. Um, Firefox and Windows actually, for some reason, will translate a percent two e into a slash, uh, which it won't do in Linux, interestingly enough. Uh, if you're dealing with the plugin and load balancing, you need to hit the same server over every time, obviously. Otherwise, you're going to be bouncing between servers and the, the JSP that you uploaded may not be on the server you're hitting. So um, server affinity with the server plugin, the web server plugin, is handled by um, the J session cookie. So J JSPs by default when they're first run actually give you a cookie. So as soon as you baseline the attachments directory, you just need to make sure that you keep your cookie, and uh, you should be hitting the same server unless that server goes down. They never go down, right? Um, so on the DEF CON CD, there's one text file with a URL to a website because I missed the CD deadline. Sorry. Um, but on the website, and I'll be uploading this, there are uh, slides. Um, there's a tool to do the mapping of your JVM, which actually will list out all of the different uh, byte combinations for UTF-8, go through them, and then show you what they're being converted to, and also what they do with the file system. Actually reveals some other issues with IBM JVM if you're interested. Uh, there's also a sample application that has nice URLs to try this on your own. Obviously, you'll need to download the trial if you don't have laws yourself. Um, there's also an exploit for the access one faults that I showed you, the same one, uh, with the source code for all of the above. So there's a lot in there, and you're more than welcome to send me an email on this and tell me that my code sucks. I would appreciate that, um, actually. So, in conclusion, anytime you're dealing with a barrier between one implementation of a specification and another implementation of a special specification, whether it's UCF8, whether it's HTTP, whether, whatever it is, this is usually a really great place to look for bugs. Um, in this case, of course, we did between the plugin and Java, and then between Java and the OS. Now, sometimes we have to deal with multiple cases. Um, some people, I, I, I talk to people about Java, and I had to do Java for my job for the last several years. And not a lot of interest in Java, but these same sort of things actually happen in uh, you know managed environments like Java and .NET. And uh, Java, of course, not immune to that. And what I really like about this is that you have a small series of these little vulnerabilities that you know you write down your reports as you know low or medium and never get fixed. But sometimes when you can weave these all together, you can actually make something that really makes a big problem. So. Um, with that, are there anybody who has questions uh, about this? <laughs>